Hello and welcome to Hollywood Crime Scene. I'm your host, Joe Hollywood, and I'm joined once again by Imaginos Pete. Hey, hey. And Andrew Firebug Walker. Andrew Firebug Walker. <laughs> yes. But uh, so anyways, our topic today is uh, the history of fire in Hollywood and the impact that it had. Now, as we go back in time, uh, I was reading this article that was uh, discussing how so many early films have been lost to time. A lot of times you'll be reading about, you know, Chaplin or Harold Lloyd or somebody, and they'll say, well, that film has been lost. That's considered a lost film. And so I was curious, like, how did these films get lost? Well, the problem was is that these films were made on something called, they were considered nitrate films, which were extremely flammable, even in ideal conditions. And so these, these films would get stored in these vaults, like hundreds and hundreds of films would be stored, and it just took one to just spontaneously combust, and an entire library would get wiped out uh, like that. Back in the day, Hollywood, everybody smoked. Yeah, including the exactly. Editors. Tossing, carelessly <laughs> tossing a cigarette butt aside could, you know, wipe out dozens of homes. And so... So in 1922, an electrical fire at Universal Studios spread to a vault where films were stored. Uh, In 1937, a fire in Fort Lee, New Jersey, obviously outside of California, uh, wiped out all of the films made by Fox Pictures up to that point. Jeez. So a vault in New Jersey caught on fire, and Fox lost all of their films up to that point. in 1937 that's shocking uh the building contained 48 vaults filled with film Uh, rko had a fire of its own mgm experienced a 1967 vault fire uh, destroying among others and this ripped my heart out a number of our gang shorts so now i don't know if there were duplicates elsewhere but apparently a lot of original our gang shorts were destroyed in that 1967 MGM fire. Jeez. Uh, a 1934 Warner Brothers fire destroyed 20 years worth of early Vitagraph, Warner Brothers, and First National films. 20 years worth of film were destroyed in a single fire in 1934. Uh, so when, when you hear about lost films, that was a big reason for that. Uh, there's another more recent fire that had a similar impact. We're going to talk about that a little bit later, but, um, but yeah, so when you hear about lost films, that's a big reason is, uh, fires destroyed a lot of films. And it seems crazy to think that all of these were kept in one location. You would think that there would be multiple copies and multiple locations yeah. for that, uh, you know, eventuality. So pretty crazy. Uh, so fires also uh, did a lot of damage to the Hollywood studios over the years. Uh, in um, May of 1950, Columbia Ranch in Burbank, which is uh, now owned by Warner Brothers today, uh, uh, fire broke out at 1.49 a.m. in the paint shop. Uh, the entire west side of their New York Street was destroyed. Embers traveled over to Western Street igniting fires. And then in 1970, three consecutive fires in January, April, and August destroyed half of that lot. Wow. And you're going to notice some weird coincidences as we talk today, but uh, this is my first mention of New York Street. You're going to have hear me mention New York Street multiple times during this conversation. Now, do you remember, you've seen uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yeah. Uh, Quentin Tarantino depicted the Spawn Ranch uh, that uh, Manson's family hung out at, and, and apparently that was based on a true story that George Spahn allowed them to uh, stay at the Spahn Ranch. Well, today nothing exists at the real Spahn Ranch because in 1974 a fire destroyed everything. The Spahn Ranch, as depicted in the movie, used to be a set for westerns and tourist attractions and things like that. 
Uh, the entire ranch was destroyed. All the films, residential, or all the film sets, residential structures were all destroyed in 1974. So when Tarantino wanted to depict the Spahn Ranch in his movie, he picked the Corriganville movie ranch, even though it wasn't a ranch at the time they filmed the movie. But that was another location that had uh, old Western structures, and they would have tourists come in and do stunt shows, and films would use that park area to do movies and stuff like that. That also was destroyed by a 1970 uh, fire, and that destroyed most of it. And then in 1979, all the remaining structures were destroyed by a second fire. Now, coincidentally, and again, the universe works in weird ways, so the Spawn Ranch was destroyed by fire. The Corrig- Corriganville Movie Ranch was destroyed by fire. Uh, after Tarantino filmed uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood at the Corriganville Movie Ranch, that area was once again damaged by wildfires. Oh, so, come on. so yeah, so it's a repeating thing. And that's that's a weird thing about these, these uh, wildfires and stuff, which we'll talk more about in a little bit. But these wildfires would surface, you know, over and over and over again. And I remember reading about a homeowner in Malibu that said that he had lost his home and all his possessions like three times Wow! and just rebuilt and continues to live in Malibu and, and accepts that as a uh, eventuality. See, now, didn't this happen earlier in the 80s and 90s when people would have beach houses in Florida or can you wipe it out? Yep. And then it's, oh, I guess I got to build a new home. Yep. The- and then the federal government finally said, you know what, we're done with this because <laughs> this is this is like we're, we're pulling the plug on this because you guys know that this is a hurricane zone. You keep building these mil- multi-million dollar homes on the beachfront. They get flooded. You you claim the insurance or you ask the federal government for help. And so so I'm just looking at the – I mean, what do you think the fire insurance is for a house well, exactly. now? We're all paying for that. These people are, you know, building in wildfire areas and storm – you know, ocean swell areas and, and they're rebuilding, rebuilding, rebuild. Meanwhile, those of us living here in Michigan keep paying the bill to cover these if, guys who yeah, just, if, if they get FEMA handouts, then yeah, that we're paying. For you, it. you know, yeah. Andrew, I know you love James Bond, but do you have to build your home inside a volcano? I just <laughs> don't understand the, I'm sure it'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, an active volcano. I know you want the, the lights and everything. Jeez. <laughs> Now, one of my favorite places to visit when I'm in L.A. is Paramount Studios. And I remember when I was living there way back in uh, 1989, uh, 1990, uh, I was touring Paramount Studios, and they mentioned how their New York Street uh, is where they filmed the opening sequence to Laverne and Shirley, five, six, seven, eight, Shamil, Shamazel. So I said, oh, where's, where's that basement apartment window? And the tour guide would say, oh, it's around here somewhere. And I'm like, well, I want to see it. I want a picture. And they're like, I think it's that over there. And I go look at it. I'm like, that's not it. I know it when I see it. And she's like, I don't know where it is. And they would, like, keep dismissing me. Well, to my shock, I found out that on August 25th, one day before my birthday, 1983, Paramount Studios had a major, major fire. And their whole New York street, uh, was burned to the ground, including all those locations that were seen in the open to Laverne and Shirley. So even though the tour guys, tour guides are still instructed to say this is where Laverne and Shirley uh, filmed, they neglect to inform the tourists that it no longer exists. They had uh, to rebuild everything. I see. So um, the suspected arson fire uh, caused over three million dollars in damage. Uh, in 83 numbers, right. uh, 350,000 square feet of outdoor sets were destroyed. Four sound stages were damaged. Uh, it started on New York Street, which was originally built in 1927. Uh, the sets for movies that starred the likes of Jerry Lewis, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, including Breakfast at Tiffany's, the Godfather films, um, all of those sets that you see in those movies were all destroyed in this arson fire. Now, there was a film that was in production at the time uh, that got caught up right smack dab in the middle of it. I want to play a little bit from a news report uh, of the fire when it happened. A piece of Hollywood history was lost tonight when a major fire broke out at the old Paramount Studio lot in the heart of Hollywood. Judd Rose reports from Los Angeles. 
It had once been home to the likes of Cecil B. DeMille, and for a time, the fire that raced through Paramount Pictures looked like a DeMille spectacular. Flames roared through the wood sets, many decades old, creating what one firefighter described as a beach party bonfire. <laughs> Sounds kind of callous. Two yeah. giant stages were damaged, as well as the studios New York and Boston Streets, site of such films as Chinatown, Marathon Man, and The Godfather. Only one film was in production when the fire hit, the latest Star Trek sequel. Actor William Shatner helped fight flames that almost destroyed the film set. The fire was just starting on the wall. We were 30 seconds away from losing it. And we helped put it out here while they arrived. And when they came, they, 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 uh, they did it. For a while, the fire threatened to spill over into a cemetery in back of the studio. Several spot fires erupted at Hollywood Memorial Park final resting place of such stars as Rudolph Valentino, once himself a Paramount star, as well as Tyrone Power and Columbia mogul Harry Cohn. No one knows yet what sparked the fire, which caused millions of dollars in damage, but no serious injuries. Paramount Pictures used to bill itself as the only show in town, and for a time today, it was. Judd Rose for Nightline in Hollywood. So yeah, pretty pretty devastating fire there, and uh, we lost a lot of iconic film sets that you can only see in movies and TV today. My God, uh, Spock! My God. <laughs> <laughs> What's that smell? And uh, so what they ended up learning from that is when they did rebuild those sets, they put in fire suppression systems and all that stuff that might have caused that that uh, original fire to not cause the damage that it did had it had proper fire suppression. So. Uh, they ended up rebuilding all those sets with modern-day fire suppression to keep that from happening again. But uh, so much history was lost there. It was just heartbreaking. Uh, Universal Studios, uh, and you know this, Imaginos Pete, uh, was the victim of eight fires yeah. throughout its history. Uh, I have a list of them here. There's a 1932 brush fire that uh, caused some damage at the studio. Another brush fire in 1949. In 1957, uh, arson fire destroyed what? The New York Street sets. There was a 1967 fire, a 1987 arsonist fire. Now, here's a really, really frustrating and crazy uh, story. So in November of 1990, this was just a couple of months after I moved back to Michigan after living in, uh, in California. And toward the end of my stay there, in, in in the L.A. area. I remember my aunt and uncle said, hey, we're going to Universal Studios. Do you want to go? I said, yeah, sure. So we, we went, we took the tram tour, and to my uh, surprise and shock, the tram turns a corner and we're in Hill Valley. Back to the, Back future. To the future. The DeLorean was parked on the lot. The set was dressed for Back to the Future because if you remember uh, episodes or the sequels two and three, were shot back to back yeah, yeah. or like almost simultaneously and was released around that time. So, um, so I got to see Hill Valley in its prime. Well, according to this, just months afterward, a security guard who was hired to guard 21 vintage automobiles that were being used for a movie called Oscar starring Sylvester Stallone, this guy who was hired to protect these vehicles started a fire with a cigarette light lighter, causing $50 million in damage again in 1990 numbers. Jeez. So the guy who was hired to protect these cars destroyed every single one of the cars. All the cars were lost. The production on Oscar, they lost camera equipment, props. Their entire wardrobe was lost. Um, the guard eventually went on trial and got four years in prison. Uh, what was destroyed again? New York Street. The very same New York Street that was seen in the uh, Dick Tracy movie, which I absolutely love. I don't know if you guys With have Madonna, seen Dick Tracy. Yeah. I, I still need to see it. Yeah, yes. yeah. Those, those sets were spectacular and so well lit in the movie. And uh, all of those New York streets were, were destroyed. Uh, Ben-Hur set that was used in the Charlton Heston film was oh, destroyed. No. And the Courthouse Square... Everything burned on that Back to the Future set except for the courthouse, which uh, had survived three total fires. 
And so when you, and I hate to say this to people planning on going to Universal Studios to see the Back to the Future set, the only original intact piece is the courthouse, which has been damaged by fire, but not destroyed. Right. But everything else around it has been rebuilt. Now, Joe, do you have a personal anecdote uh, with something that you did at the, uh, the clock tower? Yeah, they, they were demonstrating, uh, oh, well, it, it was, I wasn't on the actual clock tower, but the, during the tour, they were demonstrating the effects that went into making Back to the Future, and they, they were looking for a volunteer, and I would always eagerly raise my hand, and they would call me every single time. It was weird. So they pulled me out of the crowd. I go backstage. They put me in Doc Brown's lab coat and his crazy white hair. Have you heard this story? Yeah. And they they attach um, a cable to my belt, and I go out on a replica of the clock tower ledge with the, the lions or panthers or whatever that are on either side. The clock is behind me, and they give me that Doc Brown cable. I have to ascend, assemble the cable, which I can't because it's too short. Mm-hmm. And then lightning strikes, and the platform that I'm on spins around, and there's a skeleton in my place, <laughs> and got a big laugh and everything. And and so what? Being a Back to the Future fan, I may, um, imagine what a thrill that was yeah. to yeah. replicate Doc Brown trying to put the cable together on the clock tower ledge. That was pretty uh, yeah. neat. Yeah. So it's kind of heartbreaking to think that um, all of those sets that you see in Back to the Future are gone now and replaced with more modern structures. And it's uh, just weird, the dates of those fires you're saying, you said there was 37, 47, 57? 32, 49, 9, 57, 57, 67, 67, 87, 87, 90, and I'm not even done yet. Oh, jeez. So now here's, here's a, again, this is the universe being the universe. I think the universe has a really weird sense of humor. This guard who was hired to protect these uh, vintage automobiles was an employee of a company called Burns International Security Services. You can't write this. I know. You can't write this. Come on, man. And so he started a fire that uh, severely damaged Universal Studios. You think he was hired Um, by a rival company, rival uh, studio? No, I I think the guy was, I think they said he was a veteran. He had some mental health issues, that sort of thing. So, yeah. Uh, Another fire in 1997 did some minor damage to the courthouse, but it survived. Then, and this this is fairly recent memory. I remember hearing about this. On June 1st, 2008, uh, there were some workers working on the Universal Studios lot, and they were building a facade, and a worker was using a blowtorch to warm some asphalt shingles. They were building a facade, and I guess he was warming them up so they would be flexible enough to attach to this uh, facade. And they took a break and didn't check when they left and uh, the whole thing went up in flames. Uh, three they, alarm fire broke out. They left the torch on. I don't know if he left it on or if maybe the, the shingles had started on fire or something. I think the material that they oh, heated up had been, they hadn't like properly secured. Oh, it. yeah. So firefighters worked for 24 hours to try and extinguish the fire. Uh, again, this is Universal Studios. Uh, the fire destroyed three acres, including the final death blow to the King Kong encounter. When, when you would take the tram oh. tour, there would be King Kong trying to attack your tram. Right. That was destroyed. Um, now, remember what we were saying about the, the films that were lost in the early part of Hollywood? This, is, this was a really big controversy at the time. 40,000 to 50,000 archived digital video and film copies, including Law & Order, The Office, Miami Vice, and I Love Lucy uh, were all lost. It was reported that 118,000 to 175,000 audio master tapes belonging to the Universal Music Group were also destroyed, even though Universal's like, no, we had backup copies, blah, blah, blah. Okay, but, yeah, I, I do remember hearing about the Universal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So all of that archival material was destroyed in this fire that was started by a moron with a blowtorch. Uh, again, Brownstone Street. New York Street. How many times have I mentioned New York Street? I feel like there's 17. There's, there has to be some subtext, like some passive aggressiveness between LA and New York. It's the universe just being weird. Uh, New England Street and parts of Courthouse Square were burned once again. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was the, Biff Tannen. 
the <laughs> from, from, from the bad 1985. We can only go back in time and prevent this. So at that time, the courthouse, like I said, had survived its third fire. Um, so that was one of the more recent major uh, studio fires. And every time that happens, we lose so much history. It's it's really really heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah um, now we were talking about wildfires earlier. Um, I have some. Uh, some personal stories to share about some of the wildfires. In uh, 2018, there's a, a pretty big fire called the Woolsey, W-O-O-L-S-E-Y fire. Now, my connection to that is I'd gone out to L.A. in 2018 with a couple of friends, and we went to Malibu. I have a beach that I really love. It's a big filming location called the Leo Carrillo State uh, Park, and they film movies like uh, The Karate Kid and Grease and the beach blanket bingo movies and all the stuff were filmed at this beach. So I wanted to take my friends there and show them. <clears throat> so we went to the beach, we had lunch, we went up high up into the Malibu Hills that looked over the Pacific coast highway. And it was just absolutely stunning. And I lifted up my camera and got this beautiful shot of PCH and the ocean from a high vantage point. Well, about a week or two later, all of that, that we were looking out over was destroyed, all gone in this Woolsey fire. Um, it broke out on November 8th. My friends and I were out there, <clears throat> excuse me, late October. So like I said, it was just a week or two later. Uh, Southern California Edison, we were talking about this earlier. There's, there's a connection between outages and these wildfires, and it's no coincidence. Sure. Right. So Southern California Edison reported an outage. Two minutes after the outage, someone spotted a brush fire in the exact same area. Uh, unfortunately, there were powerful Santa Ana winds reaching up to 50, 60 miles an hour, fueled the fire, and it reached all the way to Pacific Coast Highway. And there's this restaurant on Pacific Coast Highway called Neptune's Net, and you see it in the very first Fast and Furious movie. And when I discovered it, it became one of my favorite places to visit. And I remember almost crying when I saw an image of the, the owners of Neptune's Net had taken a picture of the restaurant, and the hills behind it are engulfed in flames. And I'm like, don't lose the restaurant. Well, they managed to save the restaurant. Okay. They managed to keep the fire off the restaurant. But that photo of seeing these hill, the hills engulfed in flames directly behind this restaurant that I had just eaten at weeks earlier – Luckily, they were able to save uh, the restaurant. Uh, but more than 1,600 homes were destroyed in that fire. Celebrities who lost their homes included Kim Basinger, Gerard Butler, Miley Cyrus, Shannon Doherty, Daryl Hannah, Neil Young, Robin Thicke, and a bunch of others. And uh, and this was kind of sad, even though I learned later this has happened multiple times. There's a, a park called uh, Malibu Creek State Park. And it used to be, well, I want to say Warner Brothers, I think, owned it. And right. that's where they filmed MASH. And I had always wanted to vil uh, visit the MASH location. And my friends, when we were in Malibu, were talking about going to visit the MASH location. We said, well, we'll get there next time. Oh, no. It all burned in the fire. All of it burned in the fire. But like I said, I learned that that site had been burned many, many, many times. Now, if you remember on MASH, there's a signpost that has Toledo and Decatur, and it's, you know, 2,100 miles and all this stuff. Well, I was like, oh, my God, did, did that sign burn? Well, turned out that sign has burned many, many times, and there's a group of MASH fans who rebuild it and replant it every single time there's a mash uh fire. You think so one day they're going to build out a fire retard and stuff. Like, it's the only yeah, thing left standing. Yeah. So uh, 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 imagine what that monthly newsletter is like. Uh, so who would like to uh, put together <laughs> those, the those turn the, the the green paint for the next time it happens, guys? It happened again. <laughs> yeah. So so luckily, uh, about a year or so later, when I went back to L.A., uh, my buddy and I we took a, a long hike. I didn't realize what kind of hike it took to get back to the mesh set. Uh, we passed charred trees and everything, but a lot of that growth was coming back. And we made it to the MASH site. There was the rebuilt signpost. And all the natural features that uh, I can compare to shots of MASH, those are all still recognizable, the hills and stuff that surround it. Um, but there are several 
original vehicles, mash vehicles that are on the grounds that are just been burned several times over, but their met metal skeletons are still there. So Jeez. you could see a Jeep and the other trucks that so are on the So it looks like a war zone. Ground. Yeah, it, it looks exactly like that. And coincidentally, uh, toward the end of MASH's run, they were in production. They were filming episodes when a brush fire broke out while they were in production, and they had to work it into the storyline because the whole camp area uh, had burned. So they had to work that into the storyline so i would imagine when those jeeps and those military vehicles were damaged in that fire they just left them and now they're a tourist attraction you could go there and visit the film site and see these rusted out burned vehicles on the site of where they used to film mash out near um, malibu so uh so yeah so that fire was contained by november 21st but it had done uh, major major damage and then uh, in 2019, again, I went back out uh, in the fall of 2019, and that's usually wildfire season in the L.A. area is in the fall because the summer tends to dry things out. So my buddy and I, we had made arrangements to stay with some friends that live in the Porter Ranch area, which is north of L.A. Uh, in that area, they had filmed E.T. and a bunch of other things up there. And so we had made uh, plans with a friend who owns a home out there uh, to stay with them. Well, the day we arrive in L.A., our friend texts us and says, we're being evacuated. Uh, there's a wildfire that's creeping in on our neighborhood. And I was like, oh, no. And my friend and I suddenly had nowhere to stay. Luckily, we had another friend that stayed within LA and she put us up for a week and salvaged our whole trip and it turned out to be a blast. Um, but yeah, that subdivision heavily populated residential area had to be evacuated because the wildfires were creeping in, uh, on, on their home. Luckily their home was spared. They said a lot of stuff smelled like smoke, but that was the extent of it. Um, but that particular fire started, uh, is known as the Saddle Ridge, uh, wildfire which originated in Silmar, California. Started um, by? Uh, I don't. Bert and Ernie? It, it, if I had to guess, I would say it was another uh, Edison-connected yes, that's fire. what I'm thinking. Yeah. Um, by Friday, October 11th, so this was the next day, uh, 40, 4,500 acres uh, had been burned with 25 total structures damaged or destroyed. One guy died of a heart attack caught up in the middle of all this. 23,000 homes were evacuated, including my friends. And by the time it was contained on Halloween night, uh, 8,800 8, acres had been burned. Um, and this is north of L.A. And I guess at one point it was creeping up on the Ronald Reagan Museum that's yeah. up in Simi Valley. And it was threatened for a little bit, but um, it avoided any major damage. And I was able to visit that. Mr. Gorbachev. Uh, Turn this fire down. <laughs> Tear this fire down. Because I, I, I remember the news report. They could see it outside the library window. They were like, we yeah. can see the fire. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, so luckily, I was able to visit the Reagan Museum in 2021, late 2021. And they happened to have a temporary FBI exhibit there. And, uh, and one of the items that was on display was the original Bonnie and Clyde car with the bullet holes in it. There we go. They had it on display at the Reagan Museum. In addition to all the permanent stuff they have, like his Air Force One and uh, Marine One, which was the helicopter and everything. So, um, so yeah, the, the Reagan Museum is, was really something to see. It was pretty cool. And I'm glad it was uh, spared the fire. Um, one little coincidence that I did notice, we were talking about the uh, – the, uh, area where the mash location was when it was owned by warner brothers i this is another weird little universe thing um you know the movie towering inferno yeah most of that was filmed in san francisco but they filmed miniatures in that park in that malibu uh creek state park they filmed the towering inferno miniatures in that park which i thought was a weird coincidence considering it had burned multiple multiple times over and here they were burning a miniature replica of a high rise building so. guys you're tempting the universe stop it <laughs> so so those are some of the the uh, major fires i wanted to touch on over the you know past 100 years or so uh, that really changed the shape of Hollywood. We lost a lot of history, but hopefully they've put things in place to 
if it were to happen again, there's fire suppression in place to keep it from being catastrophic. But, you know, even as recently as 2008, that Universal Studios fire right. did an awful lot of damage, and it just keeps happening over and over and over again. And you got to wonder, what do you have to do to keep this from happening? See, that, and so. that's one of those things where you have to take into consideration when you have unique items, the, the concept of preservation can't be, you know, something you kick down the road. I mean, imagine if the Library of, not knock on wood, the Library of Congress had a major fire. Right. Imagine the works that you would lose there. Yeah. But that yeah. is, because it's such a institution, you know they have to have backed it up. I mean, if you if, if yes, went like, yes. oh, we didn't have any backups. Well, who's going to get hung? Because that's what's going to happen right now. How did yeah. you guys not back this stuff yeah, up? That's <laughs> arrogance. All that stuff is electronically. Oh, we'll get to it. Like, uh, oh, yeah. And it, it has to be. I mean, that's yeah. another thing. So, But the stuff that, you know, you talk about being lost in these, in these fires, you're not going to get that back. Yeah. I mean, luckily... You know, DVDs and things like that came around, and so things that may have been lost in fires, at least you can still view them if you have a high-quality digital reproduction. But there's something about those master tapes, those original sure. films, that when when they're lost, it just breaks your heart that you'll never be able to pull from the master again, you know? So a soft t tip of the cap to those thankless individuals who sat there and took the originals and then copied them digitally somewhere <laughs> right. in a dark room yes, yes. for hours upon hours and no one knows what they do and they did it god bless you <laughs> one one thing that uh kind of like what we, were, we mentioned earlier uh, that's famous for la and luckily they haven't had a, a big one in a while is an earthquake yeah what would happen if an earthquake fault line opened up like right beneath you know warner brothers studio and all that got lost. Right. You know. Oh, yeah. I mean, we're talking worst case scenario. I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. No. But I mean, imagine that compared to even a fire. Well, like, it's the, the, type the, of the scary thing about what you're talking about, it's not a matter of if. Right. It's, it's a matter of when. Yeah. When <laughs> is the big one going to happen? And Right. And we look at a couple months ago what happened on the border of Syria and Turkey. Turkey yeah. And last I saw was what, at least. 40, 50,000 people died. Yeah. yeah. And, and LA is the second largest city in America. And I don't like to be too grim, yeah. but it's very possible that that city could. Well, yeah. I, was, yeah. I was, I was there just recently a few, oh, like, yeah. three yeah. weeks ago. And I noticed a lot of their roads look like our roads. <laughs> and mm -hmm. for those of you that don't know in Michigan, you know, we get, we get snow. So we put uh, salt on the road. It melts, it you know, and then when it freezes, we get potholes and all that kind of stuff. And so I was seeing those kind of things in, in LA, and I was like, "Hey, what's going on with this? You guys, you had like snow for just a little bit. I mean, that shouldn't yeah. happen." He goes, "No, man." And so my the Uber driver, the really nice guy, was like, "No, man, it's uh, it's earthquakes." Yeah, bu bu buckling the yeah. asphalt. So the ones oh that you, that God. don't get registered, but if they're like 4.0, 4 4.2, they'll, they'll oh, yeah. start to tear that and up. And it's probably so it. widespread, the yeah. the county department, uh, road department can't do much. A whole lot about it. Yeah, so yeah. they try to fill those potholes where they can, <laughs> those cracks where they can. I'm like, oh, oh earthquakes! Wow, that's really you just that. said that so casually. <laughs> and I remember driving by that museum you were talking about, Joe, where they store all the cars. They have the James Bond exhibit. Yeah, the Peterson. Yeah, the Peterson one. And I said, now when now when Andrew's talking about, man, imagine if an earthquake. I'm like, they lost yeah. that museum. Uh, all those oh, cars. Yeah. Yeah, and right across the street from that is the new Academy, Academy. Museum oh, that has a lot of uh, right. I mean, you know important <laughs> props there and yeah. So, yeah, it, it's when it happens, hopefully not in my lifetime, but it, it's going to be one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the right. world. It's going to make Pompeii look like nothing. And if, if, it, if it happens uh, off the coast in the sea, you're going you, to you're have a, wave, a, a tidal a wave tsunami. in Long Beach. You know, uh, <laughs> we're about two steps away from inviting Roland Emmerich on here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> about his next movie. Him and Bruckheimer. Yeah. Get him in here. Now, you know, an underrated film, I don't hear a lot of people talk about this, but I saw San Andreas in the theater. That was oh, yeah. the rock movie yeah. about the earthquake, and it was scary accurate. Like, Really? Yeah, the way, because I, I experienced one earthquake when I lived in California. It was actually an aftershock. I was, uh, I was at Venice Beach with some friends, and we noticed some people standing around some TVs and store windows, and they were watching the TV, and I walked up and said, what's going on? And they said, oh, there's an earthquake in Upland. And I said, well, that's where my apartment is. And so we missed the initial earthquake in Upland. When my buddies and I went back toward our apartment, they needed to pick up some film at a store they had dropped it off. 
and we went up to the store. The doors were locked, and we peeked in, and everything was on the floor. Everything had come off the shelves <laughs> and were on the floor. So the next morning, my friends were getting ready to fly back to Michigan, and uh, they were like, Joe, can we borrow your car? We need to go do something. I said, yeah, I'm, I'm tired. I'm sleeping. So they took my car. I'm laying on the floor, and all of a sudden I wake up, and I'm rocking back and forth like like a little baby, like someone's rocking me. And I'm like, what is happening here? I get up, I look out the window, our apartment pool had waves in it and all the car alarms and everything started going off. And it was surreal. And it, it wasn't like you saw in the movies. Like when you watch a movie like Earthquake, you think everything is shaking and vibrating, but it's not. It's this gentle rolling wave like motion. And the movie San Andreas really depicted Captured that. that There's yeah. these aerial views of the earthquake and you see these ripples going out over LA and you see the Hollywood sign fall down and all that. There's stuff. a scene in that movie where the rock has to pick his wife, his ex-wife up at the top of a restaurant. And you can see the pool there. That's doing what Joe was talking about. The waves start shifting in and out. No, it, they did a good job in, in researching it. And, the unsung hero of that movie is Paul Giamatti. Oh, playing okay. the uh, seismologist. Yeah, who was that kind of nobody believes, right? That nobody believes, but he's kind of just kind of explaining it through there, and you're like, oh, okay, all right, we're in trouble. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it's going to be catastrophic yeah. when that happens. I mean, we all remember what happened with the San Francisco earthquake and how yeah. uh, double decker yeah. highways yeah. fell on top of each other. It happened during a baseball game. Ba- yeah. Uh, yeah, World Live Series on TV. Yeah, yeah, I remember Al Michaels. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're also- having an earthquake. Was it 94, Northridge? There was Northridge a was a big one, a yeah. A couple people passed away, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so when, when L.A. has the big one, you know, they, they have freeways on top of freeways on top of freeways. There's all these landmarks, the Hollywood sign, the Capitol Records building. To be fair, the Hollywood <laughs> sign has gone through multiple restorations. It has. It, I mean, we've seen It's uh, been through a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's been it's through. Thank you, stuff. Alice Cooper. Alice Cooper <laughs> yeah, helped yes, restore right, right. the Hollywood <laughs> sign. He's he's a uh, he's a patron saint of Hollywood. So I um, mean, with earthquakes and fires, LA is no has seen no shortage of its uh, its disasters. So yeah, and they bounce back. Yep. Now speaking of loss of information and archives, I want to play a little clip and then turn it over to Imaginos Pete. Sometimes we take a gift for granted until we lose it. In the Hollywood Library Holocaust. 70,000 books were reduced to ashes. A window to our world was blackened. But more than fire is gutting Los Angeles City libraries. Smaller budgets mean shorter library hours. Amazing how they use this fewer to books and promote funding of the library yeah. service. He can't afford it. Neither can we. That's why the Los Angeles Library Association needs your membership and contribution now. By supporting the Los Angeles Library Association, you help support our libraries. You help give the gift of books. You help give the knowledge that preserves our heritage. And we sell no wine before it's time. So that was Orson Welles. If you didn't great Orson Welles, yeah. So I had never heard about that until you sent me that link. What's the story behind the, the great uh, Hollywood Library fire? So the the Hollywood Library, uh, this fire started at 2 a.m. And compared to the one fire you talked about in Universe on, at 1.49 a.m. Yeah, so yeah. I'm starting like, well, what's going on with this? <laughs> so at 2 a.m. on April 13th, 1982, there was an arson fire that started in the Hollywood Public Library. Wow. And it ended up destroying, as you heard in the uh, Orson eloquently described, 70,000 uh, works of art were destroyed. Mm. Uh, they had lost, out of their 90,000 collection, 20,000 survived. So there you go, 70,000 that were lost. Wow. And it was, that that library had was where screenwriters, authors, artists, directors would all congregate to, sit down, enjoy work, because it, it was about, it was a library for motion pictures, for mm. the arts. Wow. And no one knows to this day what started the fire, and when the fire hit, everybody sprang into action to help rebuild it. Johnny Carson was one of the first people, gave $10,000. There used to be a place called Club Lingerie, which was like a punk rock, they, like they had all like all the greatest rock bands would, would get their start there, and then it shut down in the 90s, but they held fundraisers. Uh, the, the dancers, they were called the Lingerettes. 
they had a period where there might have been a gentleman's club, but we don't need to get into that. <laughs> uh, William Wilder's widow, she donated over 200 books of his uh, uh, personal. Yeah, collection. about yeah. the motion pictures. Alfred mm. Hitchcock's family donated over 100 years worth of this British humor mag called Punch. And a plenty, uh, but stuff that was lost was like the notebooks of D.W. Griffith and Charlie Chapman, mm. not Chapman, like oh, their their personal notebooks man. on their experiences. That's devastating. Yeah, and this is before anything was digitized. Oh, they didn't yeah. know. So way before. A lot wow. of uh, a, um, award-winning director Rod Ward just uh, donated unpublished scripts. Uh, it was. Um, it took about four years to rebuild. They they eventually did rebuild it. It's open right now. People go there. There's a grand opening. Uh, 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 Kirk Dutless cut the ribbon when they were opening it. Uh, they don't know what caused the fire. They do know that um, there were no witnesses. They never really launched an investigation into it. But the fact is, the stuff that was lost in there is stuff that you can never get back. Mm -hmm. And the irony is that this was founded by Andrew Carnegie. So a women's club in in uh, the, uh, in 1906 started the original library, and then Carney gave ten thousand dollars, and then it, this was a small rabbit hole that Joe, uh, because since we started this podcast, has almost always sent me down. Uh, so there was a a woman, and I want to get her name fully. Data Hardell Wilcox Beveridge. She was the co-founder of Hollywood. She's considered the mother of Hollywood. Wow. Her so, last name is Beveridge. Not beverage is the drink. Beverage, R I D D R I D D G E. Oh yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. So what happened anyway. was, so she's from the Midwest. She ends up marrying uh, Henry Wilcox, who is a real estate guy, and they want to start a a a community, alcohol free, gambling free, prostitution free, and has good uh, Christian values. Now, when I, <laughs> in this podcast, this is we start, I was like, well. We've done gambling. We've done prostitution. <laughs> I, think that, I think that got thrown out the window. Uh, because what happened was after Hollywood became big, they all the residents wanted to become their own town. She was like, I don't want to do it. But they're like, you're a lady. You can't vote, ironically. And it, the rest is history. It became a district of L.A. Hmm. So she, was, she loved the arts. She donated the land that they built the original Hollywood library on. Hmm. And then eventually it moved to another structure. And then 1923, they disassembled that structure, moved it down to what would be the structure that gets burnt in 1982. Wow. And they had, uh, it was, uh, what was I want to say? Um, now, did you say someone had admitted to starting the fire but then recanted, or well, was that a different? That, ironically, is a different library. Oh, okay. Cause, right. so, there, so the L.A. library has, like, a major artery. It's like the L.A. public library is the big one, and then the Hollywood was the second biggest one. So, th well, thank you for that transition because uh, there, uh, in uh, – a journalist named Carol, Carolyn Kellogg in 2018 wrote a wonderful article in the LA Times talking about this. And she interviewed uh, Susan Orleans, who wrote a book called The, uh, the Library on the 1986 library fire. And that was started by an arson. And they did arrest a gentleman named Harry Peak on flimsy evidence. Mm. They held him for three. He apparently confessed to it. At three days later, he gets released because the DA says, hey, we don't know. We can't hold him. The firefighters try to pursue him in court. Through a civil trial, he countersued uh, because, and the the logic behind there was that they were he was never going to live to see the trial because he had contracted HIV. Uh -huh. So this is around 1980s. So the fire that fire is in uh, 1986. I want to say oh, I forgot the exact date on it. I do not have the exact date on that. But what happened with that one? Ten months later, they arrested Harry Peak. And then three days later, he gets released. They never, and then they never pursued it. Even in that book that Susan Orleans talks about, they mm. kind of she kind of goes into like the romanticization of losing the stuff that you wouldn't have in there. Yeah. And uh, the library was such a thing; it was like a character. It got featured in The Big Sleep, Chandler's Big Sleep. It was one of the first uh, movies that had a uh, Bogey and Bacall. It mm -hmm. started a little string in there. Yep. And uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh, it's just you, you think about the stuff that was lost that you can't get back before. And, and it, that's the biggest thing with these two libraries is all the works that were in there at the time. And, you know, the community rallied around it. Like the, the Screen Actors Guild solicited uh, their, their members for funds and for memorabilia. 
And uh, there are pl- plenty of people that donated stuff to help mm. get it back on its feet. But it's just, you know, we're talking about the concept of fires in Hollywood and, and you know, what's lost in the studios. And then what's not lost in the studios was in these libraries. And when yeah. those go, and the 1982 fire was tragic because it seems like there were just a bunch of punks that broke in. They broke a window, mm. got in, they were found empty beer cans, they piled the books around the center, and then they lit a fire. Golly. And because this thing was built out of, you know, it went up. It went up like that, and the 1986 fire, which no one knows how it started, because that thing was built out of concrete. The they the concrete walls served as uh, furnaces, hmm. and so this fire would just jump level by level by level. And they, thankfully, wow. they got people out. Initially, they thought it was a false alarm, but hmm. it's you just you think about the stuff that was lost. And sure, people have donated stuff from their own personal things to try and restore stuff, but yeah. yeah like when I hear about the personal notebooks and and correspondence of uh, Charlie Chapman, yeah, you're never yeah. gonna get those. Can't back. replace it. Yeah, you know the story reminds me uh, here in Lake Orion where we record this podcast. Um, downtown Lake Orion, uh, back in like 2002, 2003, had a major, major fire which took out a whole side of the street there, and it originated in a restaurant called Sagebrush Cantina, which had burned to the ground and started in their kitchen. And several businesses that were on either side of Sagebrush Cantina were lost. One of those businesses was a, a independent uh, store owner who sold vinyl records. And I remember seeing a photo where his vinyl records looked like taffy in the aftermath. He had lost his entire inventory. And I interviewed him a number of years ago, and he told me the story. And I got emotional as he told me this. He said that. You know, when they finally let him into his business and he saw his inventory, he's like, I'm done. I um, I can't do this anymore. And he said the entire town and surrounding communities of Lake Orion all showed up with their vinyl records in hand and rebuilt his inventory. And he was able to reopen and sell vinyl records again. And I, I get goosebumps thinking about Is that. that. Right. Is that Broadway? Broadway records. Right. Yeah. Like I know Orion. he moved around the corner. Yeah. 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 My, but, my dad's a huge vinyl guy. And he, yeah. every once in a while he'll go. Stop yeah, by there. Yeah. My dad, so the community saved his business. My dad needs to open up a, a shop. He's got four to five thousand oh, wow. vinyl records. I yep. used to have a lot of vinyl records, and then I right. get, went over to CD and sold all my vinyl, and then regretted it. But right, right. Now, a question that people usually have when we when we talk about Hollywood and fires is: Are there any notable celebrities that have been uh, killed in fires? And I saw a list of notable celebrities. I didn't recognize a lot of the names on there. Some of them were familiar names, but they didn't happen in Hollywood. Uh, Hattie McDaniel, who was in Gone with the Wind, right. uh, or not Hattie McDaniel, I'm sorry, Butterfly McQueen. Oh, right. Butterfly McQueen uh, was killed in a house fire, um, I want to say in the Midwest somewhere. Um, and there were a couple other uh, stars uh, that have been lost in fires, but probably the most famous of all of them, the most notorious story, uh, there was an actor named Jack Cassidy, and you may recognize his last name because he was the father of David Cassidy, who he had with his first wife, Evelyn Ward. Uh, when they divorced, he m- remarried uh, with Shirley Jones in 1956 and had three sons, including Sean Cassidy. So he's the father of David Cassidy and Sean Cassidy. Well, he had a number of problems, alcoholism, bouts of uh, bipolarism, uh, neighbors saw him mowing his lawn in the nude one day. Uh, he had all kinds of issues. But uh, on December 12th, 1976, um, he had gone out for a night on the town. He had invited his ex-wife, Shirley Jones, to go with him. She declined. Uh, I read that he went out on the town with Nanette Fabre. Uh, they went out, were drinking, having fun. He came home to his uh, apartment in, in West Hollywood, uh, and he was a smoker. And after a night of drinking, he kind of collapsed in his uh, chair there, lit a cigarette, and fell asleep. And you could imagine what happened then. Uh, When they put out the fire, they found his body near the exit, meaning he knew what was going on and tried climbing uh, to the escape and didn't make it. And they had to identify him with uh, through dental records, and he had a ring on that they were able to identify um, as belonging to him. 
Um, so that's the most famous person who was lost in a fire along these lines. It's just really, really tragic. Um, if you want to see uh, Jack Cassidy in action, he did a lot of television in the 70s, um, including some Columbo episodes. And I stumbled onto a, a TV movie not too long ago that I actually really enjoyed. It's called The uh, Phantom of Hollywood, and it came out in 1974. And it's about a phantom that's trying to protect a old movie studio from demolition. So if there's, you know, someone trying to tear something down, they're killed by this phantom. And uh, Jack Cassidy is the star of that film. And it was really fascinating. It was kind of a loving tribute to a bygone era right. of Hollywood, uh, trying to save the demolition of these studios. But uh, time marches on and we lose a lot of this stuff. So... So that was just a name that came to mind when it came to um, uh, celebrity deaths caused by fire. Uh, we don't have a whole lot of time left on the podcast, but I do uh, want to encourage Andrew to share any research he did. Uh, one of the most notorious periods of L.A. history was the L.A. riots when the city was pretty much engulfed in flames following the Rodney King verdict in uh, in 1992 is when uh, the police officers were acquitted. The right. Rodney King incident happened on March 3rd, 1991. The trial uh, lasted for a better part of a year, I guess. And, and then the jury announced their decision on April 29th, 1992, and all hell broke yeah. loose. Yes. Andrew? Yep. Okay. So 32 years ago, just a couple of days ago, was the incident, the inciting incident. And if we were recording this 31 years ago today, we would be in day number five out of six days of riots wow. in L.A. 31 Yikes. years ago today, the city was smoldering. So um, I'm not going to reinvent the wheel on, on Rodney King. Uh, we all know what right. happened with, with that. But uh, um, there was some uh, uh, Korean-American and black-American um, tension and uh the south central part of the city, which is largely black, and then just, I believe it's just west of that area, is Koreatown, um, if my L.A. geography is correct. And there had been tensions there because just early 90s in big cities was, was bad to begin with. And sure. uh, there were, you know, racial tensions, which happened in this country, of course. Um, but there, that was the inciting event uh, that caused this riot. Before that... Um, there had been a couple incidents where uh, Korean American uh, shop owners had shot uh, at least, I think, at least two people, and and they were black. So mm -hmm. there were tensions, uh, you know, when these things happen. Um, all in all, uh, they estimate uh, from all the looting and uh, rioting, uh, close to a billion dollars in damage. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know if that's in ninety, nineteen ninety two terms or, uh. Today's terms, either way, that's yeah. that's a lot. Um, yeah. Many, from what I've read, many of the small independent re uh, stores, restaurants, whatever, 30 years later have not been rebuilt. Yeah. The Korean families, for whatever reason, they said, you know, we're getting out of here. So yeah. similar to what happened in our own city, Detroit, in 1967, some areas just kind of haven't recovered. Yeah. And, there, and, of course, there's a myriad of factors that yeah. go into that. And of course, Detroit is not LA, but yeah, this uh, I remember. This is one of the earliest things I remember seeing on t TV being a real life event. That and uh, the uh, the night vision of dropping bombs on Baghdad during yeah, the yeah. Gulf War. So CNN, and, yeah, yeah see, and I remember my parents trying to explain to me, you know, these people are rioting because this this happened. This the cops, they should have got time, but they didn't. You know, this is what happens. Um, but just just uh, doing a cursory overview of it, I did not know. You could, I, Of course, the L.A. sheriff would be there, the California State Police, maybe the California uh, National Guard. But the Army 7th Infantry Division was deployed, and the 1st Marine Division was deployed. Mm. Now, I don't know about you guys, but having active duty military do, do uh, law enforcement 
in American cities, that's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> it's a slippery slope. It's I mean, a slippery it slope. Is. And um, even a couple years ago with the George Floyd protests, I, we, we know the FBI was on the ground. We know DHS was on the ground. And we know that they did some shady stuff. But to have, I don't think there were ever active duty army and Military, marines on the yeah. ground or that would have caused quite a but remember quite a flare-up hw H. bush could not afford to look soft on crime no yeah, he could yeah. not no he could not so anyway um i don't have a whole lot to to give to that um i know well, i have some numbers on that uh 63 people died during the yes. la riots 3600 fires were set uh, tommy lasorda at the time was criticized for going on camera and pleading with the rioters saying you're burning your own neighborhoods, which is exactly what they were doing. But he got criticized for saying that, which I don't understand. Yeah. But 3,600 fires were set. 1,100 buildings were destroyed. But something that I just learned, uh, which I wasn't aware of, is that almost 50% of the total damage was contained in Koreatown. Yeah. It was it was that, largely targeted. Yeah. Yep. So when you say, well, this was a reaction to the police brutality, I'm sure that was the spark that started it. It was. But then they said, hey, since we're oh. destroying the city, let's head over to Koreatown, and they almost wiped Koreatown there were, off the there face were, of the There were those long simmering undercurrents. Those grievances. Yeah. Yep. Tensions between yep. each other. Because they didn't make it to Malibu. They didn't go to no, Beverly no. Hills. No. Well, they... <laughs> no. they Actively yeah. set up a perimeter to keep the rioters yeah. out of Beverly Hills yeah. and yeah. the predominantly white neighborhood. Yeah. And what the catalyst that really caused this thing to get out of control. So Ground Zero is, is almost considered a historic location. I was 71st Street in Normandy. Uh, after the verdict was read, there was a 16-year-old kid, Shondell Daniels, who threw some stuff at the police. They were trying to arrest him. The crowd started to react to that. And when they realized that things were getting bad, the police hightailed it out of there. And when the crowd saw that the police had left, that empowered them. And as people sat in their homes watching things unfold on television, you heard the reporters in the helicopter, the, the anchor would say, so what's the police response? And the reporter in the helicopter would say, none. Wow. And that caused people to get off their couches and go, hey, let's go see what's going on. And so because the police had retreated, that empowered the crowd to do more and more damage. And and it got so out of control that, yeah, the military had to step in. I'll, I'll, I'll leave you with one thing about this. And I don't know, Joe, if you came across this with your research, did you come across the Terminator 2 supposed connection? No. No, let's hear that. Multiple, and we'll, kinda, we'll, we'll wrap up on that. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. So it has to do with the Rodney King, the guy who filmed the uh -huh. Rodney King thing from his apartment. Yep. Multiple reputable sources confirmed that the biker bar scene at the beginning of Terminator 2 was filmed a few blocks away from where Rodney King was pulled over and beaten by police, and that George Holliday, who was the man who filmed the famous beating, shot footage of the filming of T2 right before the beating. James Cameron even com confirms the link in an L.A. Times article, which they have linked here. There are multiple claims on the internet that this occurred on the same night. Wow. So, so Terminator 2 was <laughs> filming blocks away from the Rodney King beating. I had never And apparently heard of that the same then. guy. Wow. Oh my God. He just panned his camera over. So, I, I, yeah, Holy. Yeah, imagine. So anyway, we need to research Only that. Only in more. Hollywood, yes. man. Oh Only my God. in Hollywood. Only in Hollywood. And on that note, we're going to wrap up. Peace out. Hollywood is burning episode of Hollywood. But Friday. Michigan is not. Please move to the Great Lakes State. We have everything. No fires, no earthquakes. Well, the rain will keep the fires away from yes, us for a little while. Yes. But, uh, guys. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening, everyone. Great. You're sharing this uh, hour with you. And yes. We'll Good night, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Yep.